thank you so much for coming to Grand Rapids. We're so pleased that you're going to be giving a talk tonight at the Gerald R. Ford Museum under the auspices of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies. You're going to be talking about your book, Saving the Jews, FDR and the Holocaust. It's a book that's uh, really, I think, elicited a lot of much-needed debate, good controversy, right? debates that we need to have in this country. And a couple of questions I have for you in the limited time we have. Could you please talk about what it's like to go up against the academic establishment with your book? Tell a little bit of background. <laughs> Here, you, you're, you're, a, you're an attorney and right. you're an historian, so you combine those skill sets and you're able to, with those skills, take on an academic establishment in a most impressive way. How did you do it? Uh, well, I think the first thing is it's a lot of hard work. You know, one thing about being a lawyer, uh, and I think the same thing's true about being a good scholar, is you've really got to know what you're talking about. So I spent about five years on this book, and I got a lot of help. I mean, I um, talked to people in the field, and I did, I did what I'd like to think I did my homework. I mean, I, I did research into primary sources. Um, and um, I decided to take on the, the academic establishment. In other words, a lot of the people who read my book said, you know, it's, there's no need to really just criticize people and take them on essentially by name, um, and there's a better way of doing this. And I did not want to do that. And the reason I didn't want to do it is the people who believe the things they believe, you know, that we let down the passengers on the St. Louis, which is just a flat out lie. Okay, and that we should have bombed Auschwitz, which is one of the stupidest ideas anyone ever came up with. Um, you know, you have to call these people out. And so, you know, I quoted the historians, I quoted the books, and I lifted the, the, the quotes that were wrong. And I pointed out that they were wrong. Um, and the academic world didn't like it. But I look at it as, you know, they've foisted a bunch of ideas on people uh, that America somehow is at fault for the Holocaust. Well, guess what? The Germans are at fault for the Holocaust, and the Americans fought and died to stop the Holocaust. And I just don't think people ought to get away with the stuff they get away with, which is um, essentially misleading people uh, to, to teach a moral lesson. Now, I don't question these people's motives. I don't think that their motives are bad. Um, I think that they want to teach a lesson that we were apathetic, we were silent, we were this and that. But the fact is, that's not what happened. And, um, and so, and you know, being a litigator, uh, I'm not, I mean, this is what I do. I mean, we, we call a spade a spade and we do what we, what we want to do, so. And remember, I don't have tenure. <laughs> I mean, I'm a lawyer, I support myself, so there's really nothing they can do to me. And, uh, and, I, and I enjoy having that independence. That's great. And, and you took on, by your estimation, how many scholars would you have explicitly taken on? I would say 25 to 30 major historians. In other words, there are probably a couple of hundred people who've written books about the Holocaust. There's one book, one of my favorite uh, books uh, is a book called Stella. Uh, and it's a, a book, I forget the name of the author, um, wrote a book in which he got all the facts about the St. Louis controversy wrong. In other words, the number of people, uh, people were dropped off uh, Danzig or something, and they went to a concentration camp. You know, it's, and and so you know that guy is not a major scholar, but I would get letters from people saying, "Well, I'm reading this other book that says this is what it, what it says," and I said, "Well, that is what it says, but it's wrong." And uh, it's just amazing to me when you just take the St. Louis for example. Um, people just write a lot of crazy stuff that's just incorrect. And uh, I mean, my information basically comes from the basic facts in the New York Times. And there's a new book out from the Holocaust Museum, which gives you the same, the same version. So um, I probably took on 25 major historians, I would say, by name. I mean, pointing out when they were right and when they were wrong. I'm, I am complimentary. In other words, when David Wyman, who's the leading scholar in this field, is right, and he's done a tremendous amount of work, I, I was complimentary. But when he was wrong, I called him on it. So you were able to go back, do original research. Right. And you spent five years of your life right. basically uh, proving what you wanted to in this book, that the right. United States did respond adequately, certainly, and probably right. did the most it could in an imperfect world. Yeah, right. And that Roosevelt wasn't the villain that uh, right. people have tried to make him exactly. out Exactly. In fact, he was a hero because, for, remember, in, in 1940, there's only one man standing who could have stopped Hitler, and that was Franklin Roosevelt. The Russians were scared to death of the Germans. I mean, as it turns out, the Russian army essentially, well, contributed more to defeating Hitler than anyone. That's true. But in 1939 and 40, nobody knew that. And the only man standing between Hitler and world conquest 
was Franklin Roosevelt. And the reason I say that is Churchill, of course, was fighting. And if it hadn't been for Churchill putting his thumb in the dike, you know, in the 30s, then Hitler would have, would have won. But Churchill could not have won without Roosevelt. And no one would be quicker to say that than Churchill. So therefore, I mean, not only is Roosevelt not the villain, he's the hero. I mean, Hitler set out to kill every Jew in the world. Well, he didn't succeed. And so, no, I don't, I just don't accept service on all of their, uh, what has now become a politically correct victimology mm -hmm. attitude about America. Okay. We had an interesting discussion earlier today about the advantage uh, that you have actually as a trained attorney. Right. So in addition to a Harvard education, getting a master's right. degree in history, you also have all these skills as an attorney that would give you a, a specific way of approaching the evidence that might be tougher, more tough-minded or something, perhaps? Well, I think what historians do and what lawyers do are, are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a good historian is going to look at the evidence and look, you know, which, who is saying this about Roosevelt and who's saying this? And then how do you judge which one is more credible? Well, lawyers do that all the time because people in cases say a lot of things, but the question is, who is telling the truth or who do you think is going to be more credible? And so I think this it's, it's, it involves a lot of the same skills and I think it's a lot of tough-mindedness too, you know, just common sense. I mean, I've practiced law for 36 years and, um, you know, I've also been in, in government. I mean, I've represented the school district, I was assistant city attorney. I know what mayors and public officials have to go through and I think having some practical knowledge of how politics really works I think is important for a historian. And of course, good historians have those skills. But I think lawyers also bring something to the table, you know?